left. Just three items, three and a half, maybe four. The, uh, the last section on rhythm was long and involved, but these are all fairly defined, linear. There's an answer or there's not in most cases. So they shouldn't be as tricky or difficult to interpret. And um, interpreting axis and rotation, we can do directly with um, these signals we get on the ECG leads, hypertrophy, infarction, all really interesting characteristics that you get from the 12 lead that you can't get from a lead to ECG. So how can we get this information about the heart from what we uh, will do in lab later on today, the 12 lead ECG trace? So we've done rate, we've done rhythm, axis and rotation is on deck, hypertrophy and infarction coming up. So axis and rotation, what do I mean by axis and rotation? It's not movement of the heart specifically. It's not that the heart can move physically in space. It's where is the net electrical activity pointed? Normally, it's pointed in a straight line towards the apex, right down the septum, and it's pretty balanced. So when we look at a normal situation, what we consider um, a normally rotated or uh, a normal axis for the heart, it's along that vector, along the septum towards the apex. So it's the net angle of all the activity of the QRS complex, where is it pointed to in space? Not where is the heart moving in space, where is it pointed to? The net vector of the electrical activity. So for axis, we're concerned about where the heart's pointed in the frontal plane. Is it pointed somewhat down to the left, which would be normal? Is it more horizontal up towards the left-hand side? Is it vertical down, which would be a rightwards um, deviated axis? It's in the frontal plane only. When we talk about rotation, then we worry about the uh, angle of the heart in the horizontal plane. So we're not spinning the, um, spinning the heart vertically. We're looking to see in the frontal plane which direction is the major axis of the electrical activity. And we use a special tool that sounds daunting called the hex axial reference system, which really only means uh, six axes. We have six leads in the frontal plane making the six axis reference system. And using that as a general uh, schematic, we have 360 degrees to look at. We can separate them into quadrants to figure out, okay, well, let's narrow down the net activity. And then using information from specific <coughs> leads, determine the actual angle of the electrical activity of the heart. So we're getting a gross understanding of what general direction the activity is pointing, and then we use individual information from single uh, leads to figure out the angle. So the hex axial reference system, made by six leads. We've seen this slide already to show you the comprehensive information that we get in the frontal plane. Three physical leads, three augmented voltage leads, there's six in total, you put them together and you get a lot of information in 360 degrees of the frontal plane. So that information is present for us. The way that we approach the net um, axis of the heart is to figure out, okay, well, what are the general quadrants before looking at the individual information? So to separate this complicated reference system into quadrants, we want to break it down into top and bottom halves and left and right halves. So we can use the information specifically from the lead one trace and the AVF trace, which is the closest trace to vertical, to figure out where the net activity is in regards to each quadrant and then fine tune it afterwards. So I'm going to take this information, 
blow it up and put it into a bit of a, a more usable form. You can imagine all of the leads shown here in the, in the green circle, but I've eliminated the rest except for these major leads, the cardinal leads. This is what makes the plot, makes the Cartesian plot, if you will, if you remember back to uh, graphing in high school algebra or calculus. So lead one and ABF divide the reference system into top and bottom and left and right halves. Combined, we have four different quadrants. We expect the activity of the heart to be pointed somewhat down and to the left. The heart is angled that way normally, so any activity that we detect down here, or if we detect the vector down here, that means it's set up normally. If we detect that the net vector goes up and to the left, it's called le left axis deviation. Down and to the right is right axis deviation. And then a complete reversal, which is extremely rare, is extreme right axis deviation. So how can we use the information from these two leads to figure out the quadrant where the net vector of the, uh, the heart is pointed? If you understand the basic principles of measuring an ECG, it's easy. Uh, depolarization. Positive wave towards a positive electrode gives you an upwards deflection. So for the net vector to be in this normal quadrant, positive wave towards a positive electrode gives an upwards deflection in lead one. Positive wave towards a positive electrode gives an upwards deflection in ABF. <laughs> you look at your 12 lead ECG trace and you see the QRS complex pointed upwards or weighted more towards the top and the bottom in both of these two traces that tells you the net vector is somewhere in this quadrant. So imagine a line going through here. It's going both towards lead one and AVF. It's heading towards both of those electrodes, so upwards deflection in both cases. What if it had a right axis deviation? What if the net vector was going down here? Is it going, is depolarization heading towards AVF? Is, is the, the, the wave of depolarization heading towards the positive electrode of the ABF lead? Yes, absolutely. So positive wave towards the positive electrode would give an upwards deflection. Is it going towards the positive electrode of lead one? No, so what should it be? How would it look on the trace? Absolutely, downwards deflection. Positive wave away from a positive electrode or towards a negative electrode gives you a downwards deflection. So if you look at your 12 lead trace and the QRS complexes are arranged as such, you can assume that it's in the right axis deviation quadrant. And the same would go for left axis deviation. We're heading towards lead one, away from AVF, upwards deflection in lead one, downwards deflection in AVF, and by process of elimination, you figured out that, well, for extreme right axis deviation, the net vector is heading away from both positive leads. That means downwards deflection in both cases, which is extremely rare. But just looking at the information from these two, um, these two leads on the 12 lead ECG trace, you can figure out what general part of the reference system to look at further. The next question is how do we get a sense of where within each quadrant the vector is pointed? It's heading both towards lead one and AVF. How do I know if it's more towards lead one or more towards AVF or exactly in the middle? How can I figure out uh, what the angle is, what the specific rotate, or sorry, the specific axis of the heart is. And to understand how to determine the angle of the heart, I want you to consider our fundamental understanding of um, these ECG traces. So we know that 
depolarization is a positive wave towards a positive electrode that gives us an upwards deflection. And we know that depolarization in the opposite direction gives us a downwards deflection. So you might be tempted to say, well, I want to figure out the angle by looking for the trace with the largest deflection. That must mean the signal is going most towards that electrode, or most, most towards the positive electrode of that lead. <coughs> but we don't know that for sure. If it has a really tall deflection, it could just be the signal's really strong. And as we kind of saw on the last slide, an upwards deflection means that the wave is heading in the general direction of that positive electrode. It could be right on, it could be slightly off target, as long as it's within this hemisphere moving towards that positive lead, it will register as an upwards deflection. But how do you know when it's heading in one specific direction? How do you know the angle? So what I want you to consider, knowing these two elements, what would happen if, because the heart's in three dimensions, what would happen if the wave of depolarization was traveling perpendicular to one of these leads? This is maybe somewhat of a small hurdle. A positive wave towards a positive electrode gives an upwards deflection, we know that. A positive wave towards a negative electrode gives a downwards deflection. What about a positive wave that doesn't go towards either a positive electrode or a negative electrode? What should happen in this case? Is there electrical activity for this lead to pick up? Where is it watching for electrical activity? <laughs> Where are the two points between which it records? They're on the screen. Any ECG lead? For me? Yeah, electrodes. It's only recording between two electrodes. So activity along the line between the two electrodes is picked up. Is this activity along the line? No. So what will it read? No deflection. Absolutely. In theory, if you have depolarization that is perpendicular to an ECG lead, perpendicular to this line, there should be absolutely no deflection. <coughs> so, in a bubble, in theory, if you could find one of the limb leads that showed absolutely no deflection, you would know the vector is moving exactly perpendicular from the line created by those two electrodes. In practice, it's not as clean as that. In practice, we look for something like this. Imagine you have the heart angled here, and I, I rotated it a bit so that you can imagine this lead one, um, this, this lead one vector, ECG trace, uh, it's lined up across the heart, the net vector is going perpendicular to lead one, so exactly away from it. I'm reading along this black line. There's no activity along the black line, so I should theoretically read absolutely nothing. There's no activity going uh, towards the positive or negative electrode of lead one. But the heart isn't two-dimensional. If the net activity is going 
perpendicular, there's some activity that spreads around the outside of the ventricles. There's some that comes out of the slide towards you. It, um, it doesn't just limit in only two dimensions. Uh, there's some ac activity that's circumventing the heart, that's squeezing the muscles, that if we measure, if we observe across this lead one ECG trace, the net activity, it's going to be balanced on either side, which means there's an equal amount going towards the negative electrode, an equal amount going towards the positive electrode. That means the net activity is moving perpendicular to that ECG line, to that vector. So up would mean heading towards, down would mean headed away. It's true if there's only um, activity along that line. If it's perpendicular to that line, you'd expect nothing. In practice, because the heart is not two-dimensional, activity moving perpendicular to that line also spreads around the outside of the heart. Some of it will go towards <coughs> the positive electrode of lead one. Some of it goes towards the negative electrode of lead one. But the net effect is that it's balanced equally, meaning it's perpendicular. And so what we're looking for in our ECG trace is this special kind of trace that is isoelectric. Isoelectric. An isoelectric lead indicates that there's as much activity heading in one direction as the other. It's equally shared by both electrodes of that ECG. And so being equally shared, it's neither heading towards or away from one end. It must be heading perpendicular. So let's take a look at an example. If we've determined the general quadrant of our heart is the normal quadrant, we have an upwards deflection in lead one and an upwards deflection in AVF, let's overlay the hex axial reference system. These are all of the leads in the frontal plane, simply overlaid here um, to give you the, the angles. The, um, the slide where I took the blue lines and the orange lines and put them together, that's them put together with angles, with numbers on them. If I have an upwards deflection in lead one and an upwards deflection in AVF, I know it's somewhere in this dark shaded green area. I want to know where it is in this quadrant. If lead three on my ECG trace showed the most balanced QRS complex, the most isoelectric QRS complex, that means all of the activity in the heart is equally balanced. It's heading both towards and away from the positive electrode of lead three. That means it's shared equally along lead three. The net vector must then be perpendicular. The, the axis of my heart then within that quadrant is 30 degrees. Because lead three was the most isoelectric, I can look and see which is, which is perpendicular to lead three. It's 30 degrees or AVR, 30 degree um, rotation in the normal quadrant. If AVF instead was most isoelectric, up and down, if AVF is the most isoelectric lead, perpendicular to AVF, is zero degrees. I have zero degrees um, deviation in the normal quadrant. If AVL were most isoelectric, balanced on both sides, well, the perpendicular electrode to AVL is 60 degrees, 60 degrees deviation in the normal quadrant. So I can use lead one and AVF to figure out which quadrant to look in. Then by finding the most isoelectric lead, it tells me the angle within that quadrant. And this is important. We need to do these two steps because defining the quadrant first allows us to say 
that the perpendicularity is heading towards 30 degrees. If I don't know which quadrant I'm in, I could easily say that the perpendicularity is moving towards negative 150. First defining the quadrant allows me to say, well, I'm limiting my, my search to only this region. I know it's heading in this direction, now I'm trying to figure out the angle within that quadrant. So you have one isoelectric table for the normal quadrant. You would have a similar table for the uh, leftwards deviation quadrant, one for the rightwards deviation quadrant, and one for the extreme rightwards deviation quadrant. Put up on the screen like this, it seems overwhelming. In practice, you're not ever going to look at all of this stuff at once. And if you follow a stepwise progression, it's a bit more intuitive. As long as we understand how the electrical signals are picked up. So I want to figure out the axis of the heart in this example. The axis of the heart is in the frontal plane. I'm only using the limb electrodes. First step is to understand the quadrant in the frontal plane. So using only the limb electrodes, I want to break down and isolate the quadrant of the net vector of the heart. So my horizontal line was lead one, my vertical line was ABF. I want to look at lead one, and I want to look at ABF, and I want to see if the net vector is moving in their direction or not. Okay, so lead one, I see a large upwards deflection that tells me the net vector is moving towards the left side. In ABF, I see a net upwards deflection, even though it's smaller, that tells me the net activity is moving towards the positive electrode of ABF. Combined, those two pieces of information tell me oh, it's in the normal quadrant, which is good. It's somewhere between this horizontal uh, lead one and the vertical ABF in the normal quadrant. Fantastic. I don't know where within that normal quadrant it is. I know it's not rightwards deviated. It's not extreme rightwards deviated. I know it's in the normal quadrant. Now I want to figure out uh, at what angle the net vector presents. So looking again at the same limb leads, my job now is to figure out which is most isoelectric, which is most balanced. By asking that, I'm asking which lead is not reading the activity moving towards or away from one of its primary electrodes? Which one is not involved in the net vector? which one is perpendicular to the net vector of the heart. So just by looking at the, uh, the trace overhead, which would you say is most isoelectric? Looking at the QRS complexes in the limb leads, which one is most isoelectric? Which one is balanced by similar signals on the top and bottom of the line? Lead three, absolutely. Lead three is most isoelectric. It's not perfectly isoelectric, but there is almost as much upwards deflection as downwards deflection. And it's certainly uh, more in balance than AVL is, or AVR, or lead one, or lead two, or AVF. Lead three is absolutely the most isoelectric trace uh, on this schematic. So lead three is measuring as much activity towards the positive electrode as the negative electrode. There is perpendicularity in lead three, where we have to consult and see, okay, now which angle is perpendicular to lead three? It's 30 degrees, and I'll just jump back here quickly to show you. Lead three being the most isoelectric means that the vector is pointed at 30 degrees 
within the normal uh, the normal quadrant. So lead three is the most balanced. There's activity both um, on each side of the line. 30 degrees is the angle of the axis of the heart within the normal quadrant, according to this example. So lead one and ABF, and then the most isoelectric lead. If I asked you something like this on an exam to, de to uh, determine the axis of the heart, I'd give you a worksheet that had this reference system and that had these tables um, printed on it. So you don't have to memorize that lead three being most isoelectric means 30 degrees, lead one means 90 degrees. You'd have this information your job would simply be to figure out, okay, what quadrant am I in, which is most isoelectric, and then using the information that you're presented with, figure out the angle. So don't memorize the tables. This will be here without any of these lines or anything kind of. So this idea of the lead being perpendicular to the electrical activity is central to understanding both the axis and the rotation. <coughs> rotation is somewhat different because in each of the chest leads now along the horizontal plane, we're looking to see if the heart is rotated within the body or the, the vector of the heart is rotated within the body. Each of these electrodes, they don't measure between two points. These are a single point and it reads along a line already perpendicular to the electrode through the body out the back of the chest. So what I want to look at in the chest leads now to understand the rotation of the heart is which one of these is most isoelectric. There's no need to determine a quadrant because we have a single point looking through the body out the back or a single point looking from under the armpit through the body out the side. If we can find one of the chest leads that demonstrates this balanced isoelect uh, isoelectric waveform, what that tells us is there's an equal amount of activity being sent towards and away from the electrode. The net vector is perpendicular to the, uh, the line of recording of the electrode. And so if I observe that in V1 or V2, which looks primarily at the right side of the heart, that means V1 or V2 is perpendicular to the axis of the heart. If I see that in V3 and V4, V3 and V4 is perpendicular, V5 and V6, means V5 and V6 are perpendicular. So the most isoelectric waveform, wherever I see that in the chest leads, indicates the chest lead that is most perpendicular to the rotation of the heart, the rotational axis. So looking at the chest leads in the schematic that we saw before, V1 and V2, look at the right side of the heart. V3 and V4, look at the middle of the heart. V5 and V6, look at the left-hand side of the heart. If I'm looking at... Uh, at V3 and V4, and I see the most isoelectric lead there. What that tells us is this line of recording is perpendicular <laughs> to the net vector of the heart. So the same example as last time. We've already determined the axis, 30 degrees in the normal quadrant. Now looking at the other half, the chest leads on this example, I want to determine which of the chest leads is most isoelectric. Balanced on the top and the bottom. Well, these are all negatively weighted. This is positively weighted. This is a bit more even. It looks like V4 is most isoelectric. There's as much upwards deflection as downwards deflection. There's as much activity towards the electrode as away from the electrode. That means it must be perpendicular to the uh, net electrical vector of the heart. 
V4 was one of the electrodes that reads in the center of the heart, the, the normal axis, through the septum between the two ventricles. So V3 and V4, if those are the most isoelectric, indicates normal rotation. This heart is pretty standard in a healthy individual. Its uh, net electrical vector is pointed to the normal quadrant at 30 degrees, and it's normally rotated in the horizontal plane. normal axis and rotation. So the key thing to understanding axis and rotation is this idea of the isoelectric leads, the balanced leads. The most balanced electrode indicates that electrode which is perpendicular to the net depolarization. When we're looking in um, the frontal plane with the limb leads, we have two points that make a line between them. We're, we're measuring or monitoring along that line between the two electrodes, and that's different than the chest leads where you only have one electrode, one point that uh, comes off perpendicular. In the frontal plane, our cardinal leads that set up the quadrant are uh, lead one and ABF, lead one being horizontal, ABF being most vertical. And the most isoelectric limb lead of all the, uh, all the leads that are there determines the angle of the axis, the angle of the net electrical vector in the heart. It shouldn't only be the ventricular axis, but that is um, certainly the most powerful, and the one that we observe most in the heart. So the most isoelectric limb lead tells us the angle of the, uh, the heart, the angle of the axis of the heart. Similarly, the most isoelectric chest lead tells us the angle of rotation of the heart. So any questions about this before we go on? The idea of an isoelectric lead being perpendicular is difficult to wrap your head around at first. But if you just think back to that um, activity in one or the other direction is being sensed by the lead, the isoelectric lead tells us there's no net activity in one direction or the other. So it has to be away from the electrons. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the first yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so it's more horizontal? Yes. What about if it's um, Okay. What if the most isoelectric uh, lead were V6? That tells us there's leftward rotation in the heart. So the net activity is more, uh, more heavily weighted towards the left side of the heart. There's more electrical activity in the left side of the heart. So this could point towards um, maybe left ventricular hypertrophy. There's more signal on the left side that we're observing. And we'll see this come back into play when we look at hypertrophy shortly. That tells us the net axis is rotated. That's the information that we get here. And if it's in V1 or V2, it's rightwardly, uh, rightward rotated. So whatever the most isoelectric lead is, tells you rightwards, normal, or leftwards rotation. And that's all we're looking at in the horizontal plane. Absolutely. Let's, how can I, let's use this thing. Absolutely you could. Let's pretend this is a nice linear vector. 
right? This power bar is a nice vector. Let's use this as an analog for the heart. Normally, the net electrical activity is in the normal quadrant pointing down. And then let's take this button, this red button, as the, the normal rotation of the heart pointing out. This is through V3, V4, and this is in the normal quadrant at 30 degrees. So the net activity of the heart is something like this. It's pointing forward, it's rotated normally, and it's down in the uh, normal quadrant. So what you're asking, what we've looked, let's, let's take it stepwise, what we, we've looked at so far is, is this rotated? Is the net activity rotated? Is the axis deviated? Independent of that, we've looked at, is the heart rotated in the horizontal plane, left or right? But in practice, you can see both a deviation and a rotation. The net activity can be both uh, deviated in the, um, in the frontal and horizontal planes. It can be deviated in the frontal plane, but normally rotated out towards the front. It could have a normal uh, axis deviation, but just be slightly rotated within the heart. So because it's in 3D, we're just looking at two opposite or two uh, complementary slices through the heart to see, okay, well, is the directionality of the heart somewhat normal? Either can be affected or both, if that makes sense. So though we consider these independently, the heart will exhibit both at the same time. The net vector can certainly be um, in a normal quadrant, but rotated. It can be leftwards or rightwards deflected, but have a normal rotation, or both can be off. The situations wh where we'll see that are in hypertrophy or infarction. So there shouldn't be a reason for the vector to be off unless something is not going according to program. Usually the heart it, it develops in a certain way and the um, signals are, are um, coordinated in a certain way, that the heart contracts in a certain way, the structures are organized accordingly. If something isn't done accordingly or something changes due to an injury, we might observe a difference in the axis and rotation of the heart. So one of the things that can happen is hypertrophy of different regions of the heart. And hypertrophy is simply more heart muscle, more muscular tissue, and therefore more signal. The muscular tissue is what is um, depolarized, contracted, what's stimulated. And if there's more tissue, we can observe more signal. Hypertrophy can occur pretty much anywhere in the heart. The atria can um, become hypertrophic, can enlarge. The ventricles can enlarge, and uh, the right ventricle or the left ventricle can enlarge depending on the circumstances. So atrial hypertrophy is usually indicated by deviations, of course, in the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization. Normally, these are balanced and equal. The atria don't have a lot of work to do. They're just loading the ventricles with the last little bit of blood. They're not really pumping against a large um, opposition, a large pressure. So they don't have a lot of work to do. But if there's an issue with the valves, for instance, if the valves are... Um, not fluid, if they're fixed, if they're stenotic, it might need or might require the atria to pump somewhat harder. And then like any muscle that you train, the harder you pump, the more regularly you train it, the uh, stronger it becomes and the more it enlarges. And that's what hypertrophy is. So normally the P wave is rounded and upwards deflected. It's, um, it's somewhat linear and direct. If we uh, observe a bimodal P wave, that is a P wave that has both upwards and downwards deflection, that tells us there's a more stronger signal traveling through the atria. 
and the shape of the bimodal P wave tells us where it's traveling. And where it's traveling usually indicates where the hypertrophy lies or where there's more tissue. So if we look at the P waves, specifically in the V1 chest lead, this one has the best view of the atria in the heart. V1 has the best view of both atria in the heart. Normally, we would expect no uh, or one single mode, one upwards deflection. If we have right atrial hypertrophy, we see um, a top-weighted bimodal P wave. If we have left atrial hypertrophy, we see a um, bottom side weighted bimodal P wave. And all this says is in V1, we have a large amount of activity heading towards the electrode and some heading away. There's more activity coming towards the electrode than going away, which means the right atrium is, has a larger muscle mass that is being stimulated to contract. There's more activity coming towards V1. The right atrium has more signal, which we interpret as more muscle mass, more hypertrophy. On the right-hand side of your screen, the left-hand side of the heart, and maybe I should reorganize these so it's not so confusing, if this bimodal P wave has a larger trough or a larger downwards deflection, that's saying there's more activity moving away from V1. What's away from V1? The left atrium's away from V1. If there's more electrical activity in the left atrium, it says there's more musculature to depolarize, to stimulate, and there's a larger negative deflection as a result. So we interpret that as more activity moving away from V1, meaning more muscle mass to uh, stimulate. And that's as easy as it is to um, diagnose atrial hypertrophy with a 12 lead ECG. Look only at V1 see if the P wave is bimodal, and see what side it's weighted towards. If it's on top, it's going towards V1. If it's on the bottom, it's going away from V1. The ventricles are a little bit more tricky. We don't use a single point of information in most cases. The ventricles are larger. There really isn't one lead that will observe both in sufficient detail. So we need to use information from a combination of leads. The ventricles generally are already somewhat imbalanced. The left ventricle is usually a little bit thicker than the right ventricle. And that's simply because the left ventricle does more work. It pumps against a higher pressure. The pressure in the arteries at rest should be about 80 millimeters of mercury. The left heart generates 120 millimeters of mercury or more uh, worth of pressure. It's a, it's a lot of work to do. The right heart, on the other hand, doesn't do that much work. It pumps into the lungs, the, the pulmonary vein, the pulmonary uh, capillary bed, where pressure is very low. So the right heart, the right ventricle, doesn't need to generate that much pressure. It doesn't need to have that much muscle mass. And so it's normally a bit smaller or less thick than the left ventricle. But in certain cases, the right heart might encounter opposition. When you move to high altitude and you're there uh, without acclimatizing for a long time, some fluid can accumulate in the lungs, increasing pressure in the vasculature uh, of the lungs. So that pulmonary vasculature creates resistance, and the right heart then needs to pump harder to overcome that resistance. You would see right heart hypertrophy in someone that is regularly exposed to that for long periods of time. In COPD, something similar. The intravascular pressure is higher because of the, um, uh, the chronic bronchitis with the increased pressure inside the alveoli. It can block off blood flow through the pulmonary vasculature. If there's pulmonary valve stenosis, so as you pump out of the right heart through the pulmonary valve, you want the valves to move out of the way, right? So blood can freely 
pass by. If they don't move out of the way, if there's a small opening, the heart needs to pump harder in order to, to expunge or expel that blood. Anything that increases the workload of the right heart will make it hypertrophy. So what we're looking for are leads that can specifically monitor or observe the activity in the right heart, in the right ventricle specifically. And so we're immediately drawn towards V1 and V2 because V1 and V2 are the chest leads that we know observe the right side of the heart, and they can certainly observe the electrical activity when the ventricles depolarize. So let's look at V1 and V2 and how they compare to the other chest leads as we progress leftwards through the heart. If we observe large QRS complexes in V1 and V2, that tells us there's more activity in V1 and V2, which might indicate a larger muscle mass on the right side of the heart. What does that look like in practice? Normally, as you progress through the chest leads from right to left, this is what the QRS complex should do. This is how it should change as you progress from V1 through to V6. There's a smaller QRS complex on the right-hand side. There's also a larger negative deflection, meaning there's more activity heading away from these electrodes. And that's fine, because normally the right side of the heart is weaker than the left side. Well, as you progress toward the left side, QRS complex is larger. The, uh, the amplitude is, is larger physically. And there's more activity towards these electrodes on the left-hand side of the heart. This is what we would expect normally. In a situation of right ventricular hypertrophy, the roles are reversed. The right ventricle when, um, when it hypertrophies, would have a larger muscle mass. There would be more contraction and more signal on the right side of the heart. We would observe a greater deflection towards V1 and V2. So notice, large QRS complex, upwards deflection, signal heading towards the right side of the heart, indicating hypertrophy on the right side of the heart. As you progress towards the left-hand side, the relative strength of contraction is smaller. The amplitude is smaller. And because the right heart dominates these readings, you see a lot of activity away from V5 and V6 towards the right side of the heart. This indicates a clear imbalance of right uh, ventricular hypertrophy. How do we qualify hypertrophy? We measure the Q or the R and the S complexes, the R and the S waves. If the R wave in V1 is over six millimeters tall, and if the S wave in V1 is over two millimeters deep, I suppose, those are the thresholds where when the deflection is larger, we say there is right uh, ventricular hypertrophy present. Up to that point, it's still considered normal deviation. But if we reach and surpass these thresholds, we can confidently say there is right ventricular hypertrophy in this trace. So we have a definition for hypertrophy. We can use a ruler and measure these two waves. We can also understand the qualitative relationship between all of the signals in these chest leads. This should happen normally where there's a more uh, heavily weighted left side or activity on the left side of the heart. But if we see the opposite, more heavily weighted activity on the right side of the heart, that leads us to think right ventricular hypertrophy. I should, um, I should point out, remember when we looked initially at rate, there was that box on the left-hand side of the chart that was just straight up, flat across, 
That's the calibrating measure. That's one millivolt. And that's always the same. Usually that is one millivolt and it's a centimeter tall. So this, um, this qualification is assuming you're using that same scale. If one millivolt equals 10 millimeters or one centimeter, then these measurements hold up. If the scale is different, which it shouldn't be, then you would scale these numbers accordingly. But if one millivolt is 10 millimeters, then an R wave over six millimeters indicates uh, right ventricular hypertrophy if you see that in V1. What about left ventricular hypertrophy? In what conditions would the left ventricle enlarge? Well, like we talked about, the left ventricle is normally larger than the right ventricle because it has to do more work. So if our understanding of the adaptability of not only heart muscle, but the body in general, uh, holds, then any time the left ventricle has to do more work than normal, we can expect it to train, it to adapt to that new higher workload. And a situation where there would be a new higher workload would be with uh, persistent high blood pressure, persistent uh, cardiovascular disease, so a difficulty with forcing blood through the vasculature, Anything that requires the heart to pump more forcefully to expel the same amount of blood would increase or augment the workload of the left ventricle. You'll see this often with exercise too. With exercise, we increase the duty cycle of the heart. It has to pump faster. It creates more pressure. So with regular exercise, you will see some hypertrophy which is fine, which is normal. The heart needs to do that, that extra amount of work because you require that of it while you exercise. It's different than the hypertrophy you observe with high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. The heart still needs to do more work, but you're not doing it to accomplish um, exercise or anything external. It's the secondary effect of a poor lifestyle choice, perhaps. So... To, uh, to assess left ventricular hypertrophy, our first thought is to look towards V5 and V6. They measure the left side of the heart, and so looking in V5 and V6 would seem intuitive. And we do look towards V5 and V6 in part, but we also use V1 as part of our uh, diagnosis because we can measure the, the amount of activity heading away from V1 in a sense. V1 seems to be um, a good location to measure the amount of activity heading away towards the left ventricle. And I'll show you what that looks like coming up. It's somewhat perhaps non-intuitive. But our normal trace, our normal progression of the QRS complex through the chest leads, again, shown here. Same as the last slide where we talked about right ventricular hypertrophy. What we're looking for in this case, though, because the deflection is already large and positive in V5 and V6, if it's more large, if it's larger and it, it's more positive, we don't know if that means that it's hypertrophy or just where we set up the lead is collecting more of the signal. And so we include V1 in our assessment because this helps us understand whether it's not just picking up more of the signal, but there is actually a progression, uh, a distribution of the activity away from the right side towards the left side of the heart, which would be characteristic of left ventricular hypertrophy. So notice everything is just extreme in this case. We see this progression looks similar to a normal uh, progression through the chest lead. It's just larger. From V1 through V6, we see a progressive upward shift of the QRS complex. The amplitude gets bigger. How big it gets could be because of hypertrophy. It could be because we're just detecting more of the activity. 
So looking at the downwards deflection of V1, that is the activity away from V1, and the activity towards V5, towards the left ventricle measured by V5, the combined deflection, if it's over 35 millimeters using that standard scale, would indicate that there's left ventricular hypertrophy. Negative signal in V1 indicates there's activity heading away from V1. The positive signal in V5 indicates a lot of activity heading towards V5. Combined deflection, the sum of both of these boxes, if it's greater than 35 millimeters, indicates hypertrophy. So this tells us about the, the features of the heart, the chambers individually. Atrial hypertrophy, we don't separate left versus right except to say that if the bimodal P wave is weighted one direction more than the other, we can point towards left versus right hypertrophy, but we only need to look in V1. Compared to a normal QRS prog uh, progression, which should get bigger as you move through the chest leads, if instead we observe a decreasing QRS magnitude, that tells us there's more activity weighted towards the right-hand side of the heart. It's not weighted towards the left like we would expect. And the sum of the R and the S waves in V1 will allow us to quantify right ventricular hypertrophy. On the left-hand side, we should see the same or similar progression, but just exaggerated, a larger than normal electrical activity. We use the R wave in V5, the upwards part of the QRS complex, and the S wave in V1 their combined deflection being more than 35 millimeters tells us there is left ventricular hypertrophy. So we can assess whether the net vector is tilted along its axis. We can assess whether it's rotated horizontally we can assess whether the heart muscle, or more specifically, the signal of the atria or each ventricle is larger than normal, indicating more muscle mass, indicating hypertrophy. And the last element that we need to assess is infarction. I'm going to keep going because we've got a few slides to get through, and I want to get through these today. So infarction. Infarction is a rupture of cardiac myocytes, cell death. Myocardial infarction is a heart attack. There's no electrical activity in any areas that have been damaged or that rupture as a result of a heart attack. So infarction is necrotic tissue, dead tissue, tissue that doesn't contract, tissue that doesn't depolarize, tissue where there's no activity or signal. And so infarction indicates a previous injury. We can use the 12 lead to diagnose a previous injury, but I'll also show you how we can predict this injury in some cases. So we use the absence of a signal to determine whether there is hypertrophy and or sorry whether there is infarction and where that infarction exists the absence of a signal and the absence of a signal specifically uh, a negative or a larger than normal q wave indicates the absence of a signal and we can use that to help diagnose or interpret understand infarction. Now infarction is typically 
I'm not going to say that it's only limited to the ventricles, but we normally only observe it in the ventricles. The coronary arteries that feed the ventricles are the ones that tend to become blocked and occluded and then cause cell death or infarction in the distal tissue. So being that the ventricular tissue might be um, the tissue with an infarction, the Q wave, a large downwards deflection in the Q wave or a larger than normal Q wave, indicates to us where that infarction occurs. And it's not immediately obvious why that's the case. Let's imagine a scenario where I'm looking down into a ventricle. So this is the same picture as the hex axial reference system, but it's not that. I just copied and pasted because I already had it made. So let's imagine that we're looking into a ventricle. The apex of the heart is behind the slide. You are at the base or the top of the heart, and you're looking into the bottom of the ventricle. This uh, rim around the outside is the wall of the ventricle. And so when it contracts, it would squeeze and expel blood out the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. So you're looking down into the ventricle. Does that make sense? Okay. So all of this is the wall of the ventricle. We want to know if there's been damage to the musculature, the muscle in the wall of the ventricle. Now through applying the leads of a 12 lead ECG, we get information about how the ventricles work. Let's imagine a hypothetical lead between these two electrodes that looks across the ventricle. This would pick up any electrical activity that went towards the positive or towards the negative electrode. Whatever the activity happened to be, you'd see all of it. Anything along that line, you'd be able to observe and record. Okay? There's no impediment. It's not impeded. We don't know what the activity is, but you would see it if it was there. What if we had set up our electrode, our electrodes, so that the line between them intersects some necrotic or dead tissue? What if this line happens to fall along a previous infarction? Well, in the first example, we're reading all of the activity. The, the walls of the ventricle are contracting. They're being stimulated. They're shortening and squeezing out blood. This part of the wall is not contracting. It's not being depolarized. It's not shortening. It's not generating force because it's dead tissue. So this lead will only pick up information heading away from the positive electrode. There's, there's nothing over here to monitor. You're only getting the information on this left-hand side of the lead. Most, ele sorry, most electrical activity is moving away from the positive electrode. Well, depolarization is a positive wave. A positive wave towards a negative electrode gives us a downwards deflection. So, if we observe a larger than normal downwards deflection in any of our leads, that tells us, well, we might have just landed across an infarction. So as the ventricle contracts, we have a normal QRS complex that we're expecting, but if we have a larger than normal Q wave indicating lots of activity moving away from the positive electrode, it could be because the tissue at that positive electrode is necrotic, it's dead. We're measuring across an infarction. And so we have a lot of ability to monitor, measure, and place an infarction within the heart using information from various leads. If we look at the uh, chest leads, V1 through V4, 
one right side of the heart through v4 towards the septum anywhere across the front of the heart if we see a large negative q wave that tells us there's some infarction in the front part of the heart the anterior aspect of the heart If we observe a pronounced Q wave, a large negative deflection in lead one, AVL, V5 or V6, that tells us that there's some area on the lateral border, the left lateral border of the heart that might be infarcted, that might be necrotic, that might be damaged. If we see a pronounced negative Q wave in lead two, lead three, or AVF coming from the foot. That means the inferior border of the heart might be infarcted. We don't have, because of the placement of our electrodes, any real way to look at the posterior aspect of the heart, which is somewhat unfortunate. So let's see what that might look like. This is an example of a 12 lead ECG trace from a patient with an infarct. Let's take a look at large negative Q waves. Okay. So larger than normal negative Q waves. Q, R, S. So these are slightly larger than normal. These are pronounced negative Q waves. Downwards deflection before the QRS complex, or before the R wave is generated. Lead two, lead three, AVF tells me, lead two, lead three, AVF tells me something in the inferior aspect of the heart. There might be some damage along the inferior border of the heart. There might be an inferior infarct. So along the lower border of the heart, is there anything else? Yeah, there's pretty obviously a few other things. Look at these large negative deflections in V1, V2, V3, V4. Large negative deflections in V1, V2, V3, V4. Not only is there an inferior infarct, there's very likely an anterior infarct as well. So significant damage in this example on the inferior and anterior borders. Now it's hard to say which is more impacted. It's Likely that the anterior aspect is more affected because the deflection is larger. But um, this as a tool for diagnosis should really be used as, okay, there's something going on here. We know it's in these regions. Now we need to do um, a more comprehensive echocardiogram, for instance, to look at if there's actual damage and image that damage. So this is telling us where to look and how likely it is there's something there to, uh, to do the actual diagnosis. We want to use a bit, um, we want to use a methodology that's a bit more robust in, in detecting these, uh, these errors. Now, I just want to bring up for you quickly one of the last slides because sometimes we see these downwards deflections. Why is this a large negative Q wave? And I just want to compare to Let's look at the, um, one of the examples that we just looked at. These are hand-drawn, so take the, the, the comparison with a grain of salt. But there are large negative deflections in some of these electrodes that we present here normally as well. These are not Q waves, though. These are the R waves pointing down. The Q wave, Q, R, S, Q, R, S. Notice there's this upwards deflection first, followed by the downwards portion of the QRS complex, whereas in the last example, no 
upwards deflection. This is just Q wave, large negative deflection moving downwards. So there's a slight difference between what we would expect normally and then what would be exhibited by a patient with an infarct. So large negative Q wave tells us a lot of activity moving away from the positive electrode. We're not observing anything moving towards it, possibly because that tissue is dead. It's not receiving signals. It's not contracting. But we can get a sense. That information goes, um, it tells us about a previous injury that exists before you make the measurement. We can get information about an ongoing injury from our 12 lead ECG as well. An infarction is myocyte death that usually results from ischemia or hypoxia. If the oxygen supply to the cardiac tissue is ever lacking, that is usually what causes those cells to uh, fail and rupture and die. Wouldn't it be nice if we could observe or measure ischemia? Not infarction, which is the death of cardiac myocytes. What if we could measure those cells that are struggling to receive oxygen? And we can by looking at the deviations in the ST wave. The ST wave the portion of the wave between the depolarization of the ventricles and the repolarization of the ventricles. How quickly can you restore the com uh, compartmentalization of ions inside and out of the cells? How quickly can you re return to a normal situation and repolarize the tissue? Normally, the ST wave, the ST segment, is flat. There's quick restoration and return to normal of the cardiac muscle cells. If it's not flat, if it is raised or depressed, that indicates some trouble with returning to normal. If it's depressed, we're not looking at that in this example, but if it's lower than normal, that, um, that would indicate exertional angina or chest pain, which is obvious during a graded exercise test if you are in a cardiac rehab center. You wouldn't observe this at rest. You would observe a depression in the ST wave as you had a person on a treadmill doing a light walk and gradually in increasing the intensity. You'd be able to observe a depression in the ST wave indicating progressive lack of oxygen. If it's elevated, like we see on the right-hand side here in this progression, that indicates there's supply angina. There is chest pain associated with a reduced ability to supply blood to the heart in normal resting conditions. The coronary arteries might be blocked. The coronary arteries might be narrowed. And so any elevation of the ST segment indicates whatever the situation is at rest, it's not getting enough adequate oxygen supply to the tissues of the ventricles to allow them to repolarize normally. So if we see an elevated ST segment at rest, this can indicate current ischemia. On the order of hours, this is what the QRS complex would look like for a patient with acute ventricular ischemia an inadequate oxygen supply. This progresses oh, without an apparent Q wave. Notice, notice we have apparent Q waves here. If we see an ST elevation without an apparent Q wave, that would indicate an immediate ongoing infarction. So as this progresses, this is the infarction progressing and then how it recovers over the course of a year. The ST elevation indicating inadequate supply leading to um, a progressive worsening of the ischemia and infarction. Now, what this means is when there's less oxygen, normally the cardiac muscle cells can switch somewhat 
to use energy from other sources, but they have a limited capacity to do so. And they do because there's always the demand for ATP. There's always the demand for energy in cardiac muscle. Not like muscle that you turn off when you take a break and, and rest and relax. The heart is always pumping. So it needs a constant supply of energy. To do that, it needs a constant supply of oxygen. If it doesn't have adequate oxygen, then its production of energy slows. And so less available energy means less energy for sodium potassium pumps, for calcium pumps. Movement of ions is less, well, let's say less quick. It's suboptimal. It's slower. And so the return to a normal state is delayed. That return to a normal state we see um, present as the elevated ST segment. Class end at 9:30. Yeah, it does. I think we're I think we're over, aren't we? Okay, um, we're not going to finish this in enough time today. So let's let's come back on Tuesday. We'll take up the last couple examples. There's a couple um, elements about what information on the 12 lead trace is usable, what's not. We'll um, return to this example of observing an infarction as it on is ongoing. Um, otherwise.